Romans chapter 7. We're going to spend this morning's message in the same verses we looked at last week, if you were with us. But it won't be the same message, I promise. I'm going to try to build on last week's and bring out another portion of this that I think is important for us to understand. And I really am praying, hoping that it will be used to the Lord to be a, a blessing and a help to us all. I do think this is an area that was often misunderstood. I think it's an area that we often struggle with in our own lives as Christians. I think it's something that sometimes brings Christians great grief and despair. And I hope that spending some time here this morning might help in that area. I know understanding these truths has helped me often. I hope it will help others here today as well. But I'm going ahead and read all the verses, even though we did look at them last week. I'm going to read them again before we preach. If you'd follow along with me, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through the end of the seventh chapter. Paul, writing here to the Roman church, says, Was then that which was good, and we have already established that this he's talking about the law of God, in this case the, the moral law of God, specifically the Mosaic law that he had given to the nation of Israel. Was then that which was good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So as we look at these verses and we wrap up this seventh chapter, I've entitled my message this morning, Paul's Four Lamentations. Paul's Four Lamentations. He's lamenting certain things that he says are true concerning him. And I want us to explore those and see what it meant for him and what it means for us as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us today. As we come to this text and we seek to devote these next few moments of this service to uh, reading them, explaining them to the best of our ability, thinking upon them, and then asking that your Spirit would apply their truth to our particular situation and life experience. Father, we um, need your truth always. Your Word is life. Your Word gives direction. Your Word sanctifies. Your word comforts. Your word convicts. Your word is all that we need, Lord, in this way. It's, it is what, as the scriptures themselves say, we actually saved by the word. And Lord, it's interesting how there is that play between your son being the word and the written word. And Lord, we know that there is never any contradiction between the two. They are harmonious and and united in your perfect plan and work in our lives. So I guess I would say this morning, as we look to the written word, may we, through your spirit, also examine the word, your son, the word made flesh, and how it pertains to these realities that we'll consider this morning. Lord, we ask your help, we ask your blessing. I certainly do as the one speaking, but all of us ask for it as the receivers of your word. May you take your word and use it in our lives as you see fit. And for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a good friend uh, who lives in Maine that uh, we knew. He was in our church when we were there. And he, on a regular basis, uh, watches uh, the, the services here that we post online. And often we'll, we'll call and we'll have some discussions about that. We used to do that there. We'd go out to a restaurant or something, sit down and talk about the Bible. And so we still do it by phone, which I'm glad we're able to do. And he called me this week and he was talking about last Sunday's sermon out of this uh, passage of Scripture that we were in last week. And in the midst of our conversation, he made this statement. He said, when are you going to get out of Romans 7 and get into Romans chapter 8? 
And I know he's probably going to hear this message this morning, so I'm not in any way trying to belittle him or make fun of him, because I know this isn't what he means by that. But I have heard others express that sentiment when talking about this teaching of Paul here in these various passages. They would say, why would we want to spend very much time dwelling on the negative? And it is, in a sense, negative. We'll certainly see that this morning. Why would we want to spend any time dwelling on the negative teaching contained here in Romans chapter 7 when there is so much wonderful positive truth for us to enjoy and revel in when we get into Romans chapter 8? And again, this is not aimed at my friend, but the answer, if I was asked that question by someone legitimately who was proposing that we should just kind of maybe skim over Romans chapter 7 so we can get on to the goodness of Romans chapter 8, I think my answer to them would be this. We will never rightly understand or appreciate or fully benefit from the teaching of Romans chapter 8 until we fully understand and accept the teaching of Romans chapter 7. I really believe there are a lot of Christians, I say, I assume others because I know I did, and still sometimes do, Christians who struggle in their Christian experience because they are attempting to live the truth that we're going to discuss here in the next coming weeks in Romans chapter 8 without a proper understanding of the reality of their lives as it is reflected here in Romans chapter 7. And so while this will be, Lord willing, my final message here in Romans 7, and we will move on to chapter 8, I do not want to move on without us having an opportunity to give a little bit more careful consideration to the truth that is written to us here in this particular text. Last Sunday, if you were with us, you know that we devoted the morning's message to the same verses, but seeking really to answer just one simple question. Who is this man? Because all through these verses, the person here is saying, I, 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 I. This is the reality in my life. So we were asking, who is this person? And we didn't spend a lot of time here because I don't think it was necessary. I just basically articulated that it seems almost without question that the person being spoken of here, or they're doing this talking, is the Apostle Paul himself. But the question we asked was this, what stage of the Apostle's life is being represented here by the teaching that we're considering? And we said there really have been proposed at least four uh, stages of the Apostle's life throughout Christian history, and that various groups will latch on to and still hold to today. And they all, as we looked at them last week, we see they all have some valid points for holding to them. Uh, and we discussed them. We said, is this section describing Paul as an unsaved man? In other words, are these things that he declares here in this verse about himself, are they things that he is lamenting about his life when he was an unsaved individual? When we looked at some of the reasons why that could be the case, and there are Biblical reasons why this could be the case. But we also spent some time looking at biblical reasons why it doesn't seem like that could be the case. We then asked the question, is this describing Paul as a carnal Christian? In other words, yes, he's a saved individual, but he's, he's just not really living the Christian life like he should. You know, he, he hasn't been walking with the Lord. He hasn't been in his Bible. He hasn't been doing the things that would, would make him a spiritual person. Is he talking about himself as a carnal Christian? Christian. And again, we saw there could be valid reasons for seeing this. And as I said last week, certainly there is an element of carnality. We'll look at that this morning that is de being depicted in these verses. But are we to assume if Paul is speaking in the present tense, which we tried to lay out last week, and undoubtedly he is, are we saying that the apostle of Jesus Christ is a carnal Christian? I'm not too comfortable saying that. So I don't know that we would come away saying, yes, this is Paul, the carnal Christian. Another application of these verses could be this, we said last week. He could be describing himself as yet unconverted. So in other words, he hasn't yet been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, but he is in a new area of his life as it pertains to the law, because now through this Holy Spirit, he has been enlightened to understand the true reality of the law and how he is now falling short of that reality. And there are a lot of men I really respect uh, in, in the Christian faith who hold that position. Again, we looked last week that there are various good reasons to assume that this may be what the Apostle Paul is talking about in this text. But yet we also show that there are just some holes in that a, a position that seem almost impossible to, to overcome. And it doesn't seem to me like that can be the proper uh, interpretation of these verses. Well, that left us with the fourth and final position, the one that I said, I have come to adopt, and the one that I'm certainly proposing here in this text, and that is that Paul is describing himself as a maturing Christian. 
In other words, Paul is saying, this is my reality right now. As an apostle of Jesus Christ. As the one who is writing this letter to you Roman Christians, trying to advance your faith. The one who is trying to declare to you what is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That it is this Paul, a maturing Christian, who is describing the reality of his own life at this particular time. If this interpretation is correct, and I believe it is, you'll have to decide for yourselves, then we come to understand that Paul is actually describing what all maturing Christians face as they seek to live their lives to the glory of God. And if this interpretation is to correct, then this teaching is vitally important for us to understand and accept if we are going to be in a proper position then to appreciate fully and benefit from the teaching he's going to give us in Romans chapter 8. As I thought of ways to try to approach our text this morning, I wanted to be open up front and say that I adopted a, 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 an approach to this text that John MacArthur used in his commentary. I'm not preaching his commentary, but I'm using his four main points. And he called it the four laments, or Paul's four lamentations, and I really liked that. It helped me as I thought through some of these parameters, so that's the approach I'm going to take this morning in this text. So I want to break those down for us, and we're going to look at them as we work our way through the text. So what four things does Paul lament in this particular passage of Scripture? The first thing I think that we find him saying is this. Paul's first lament is that his flesh is sold under sin. His flesh is sold under sin. Let's look at verses 14 through 17 of our text. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now you can see in your Bibles that verse 14 begins with a conjunction. It begins with the word for, and therefore Paul is connecting his current thoughts to something he has previously taught. What has Paul previously been teaching? Well, Probably in one sense, it goes all the way back to verse 7, where he was seeking to answer the question that he proposed himself for teaching purposes, and that is this, is the law sin? And Paul, in answering that question for the Roman Christians, has concluded that the law itself was not sinful, but the law had brought out Paul's sin. The law had not only convicted Paul to be a sinner, because of his failure to live up to his righteous expectations, specifically he used the commandment to not covet as the main one for his emphasis. But the law, he went on to say, had been used by Paul's own innate sinfulness to bring about more evil in Paul's life. Paul had also asked the question, was then that which was good, obviously speaking of the law again, was that which was good made death unto me? Was the law then made death unto me, Paul asked the question. And again, Paul's answer was no. But he does say this, sin did work death in Paul through the law. And because sin was able to do this, the law made sin even that much more sinful in Paul's life. So now Paul issues his first lament, and his lament is connected to the truths he has just articulated. He says, for, meaning the idea because, because we, Paul and the Roman Christians, know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. What does Paul mean when he states the fact that he is carnal, and by by extension, that the Roman Christians are carnal? And by extension, then, if that's true, that we, the Christians sitting in this auditorium this morning, that we also are carnal. What does he mean by that? I think he is speaking of the fact that there is part of him, and therefore part of us, that is carnal. Perhaps we could use the term fleshly, or we could say that it is of the flesh. And we know from Paul's teaching here and the teaching of Scripture in other places that the fleshly part of man, the carnal part of man, if you will, is that part of our humanity which is still not yet redeemed. In other words, it hasn't yet received the impact, at least fully, of the redemptive power of the gospel. Now, before we move forward and and think about that a little bit, I want to deal with something right here because I think we sometimes maybe either misunderstand or abuse. And that is the idea of the dichotomy of the Christian man, or in the sense that man is kind of divided into various parts. In this case, we'll just speak to perhaps two parts. 
When we hear Paul speak of being carnal or being fleshly, I think we come to understand that he is speaking of the yet unredeemed portion of the Christian. When Paul at other times speaks of using terms like of the spirit part of man, or perhaps he would call it the new man, or he would refer to his new nature that he has received from Jesus to the point of his salvation, we understand in that case that he is speaking to the part of the Christian that has been fully impacted by the power of of the gospel. The part of man that we could honestly say is without sin. It really is the reflection of the nature of the righteous Jesus Christ. And while it is important for us to understand the reality of this dichotomy in the Christian man, I do think this, I think we often run the risk of making too much out of it. While Paul is more than willing to acknowledge that he has a redeemed nature that is righteous and that never sins, and a still yet unredeemed flesh, which is continually hampered and often controlled by sin, Paul never ceases to view himself as anyone other than who he is. In other words, can we say it this way? When Paul speaks of himself, he's speaking of himself. He's speaking of Paul as Paul. He's speaking of himself as one individual. Paul cannot act like his flesh does not exist, for it obviously does. And its reality is revealed to Paul every day. Now, the reason I want to bring that out and, and, and get us thinking along those lines is this. When Paul writes, I am carnal, sold under sin, that's exactly what he means. This is why Paul is lamenting his condition in this particular passage. Paul is in no way denying who he is in Christ. He will acknowledge this several times throughout even this section that we'll look at this morning. But he is also not willing to illegitimately act if his flesh is not real, and that is if he is not often controlled by sin. And because Paul sees himself as one individual, he is not willing to act as if his fleshly sinfulness is unimportant. Because Paul's flesh is sold under sin, Paul is negatively impacted by this fact. And this is the reason why he laments. I bring this up because I've met people in my Christian experience. Perhaps you've met them as well. I had a gentleman that sat in my office not all that long ago. We had several conversations along these lines. And at the end of the day, while I love this individual, and I'm not doubting his salvation at all, and we agreed on many parts of salvation, when it got down to this issue, it almost... He gave the impression, and I think he honestly believed this by some of the things that he said, it didn't really matter if he sinned anymore. Because that wasn't him. (laughs) He wasn't sinning. He always did what was right, because he was only thinking of the part of him that was new in Christ, and this old part that still was sometimes had struggles with sinful temptations. Well, that's not him. Well, no, Paul never approaches it that way. He may speak about this division of man at times because he needs to for us to understand what's actually operating within the realm of our being, but he never acts as if this person doing these bad things isn't me. (laughs) No, he has to own up to it. It is him. Paul's flesh is Paul's flesh. All right, doesn't belong to some other entity out there. Just like his spirit is his spirit when it's obeying and serving God in that regard. Now, If this is what Paul is trying to say, and I think it is, then if we were to ask Paul, how do you know this is true, Paul? How do you know that your flesh, in this sense, is sold under sin? How do you know this, Paul? His answer would be verse 15. Because he says, this is how I know it. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now, our King James Bibles have chosen to translate the Greek word gnosko as allow here in verse 1. For that which I do, I allow not. I'm sure they had good reasons for that, and there's nothing wrong with that that word if you want to look at it that sense. But it's interesting, in almost every other place in the New Testament, the King James translates the word gnosko as the word know, or the word understand, or the word knowledge. It always seems to have that concept of, of what we know to be true in that sense. And if we at least bring that nuance of the word into this verse and what Paul is saying here, I think then Paul, we could maybe enhance our understanding of this by saying with this, Paul is saying, the things which I do, I do not understand. (laughs) In other words, I can't explain to you why I, Paul the Christian, do these things that I do. He then goes on to write this, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, Paul says, that do I. Have you ever felt that way as a Christian? 
I have. Do you ever find yourself asking yourself those questions, thinking those thoughts? Why did I just do that? Why did I desire that? Why did I think that? Why do I so often find that I have done the very thing I didn't want to do? You get up in the morning, you have your time with God, you're ready to face the day, you've made these commitments, these thoughts, these goals, these aspirations, this is how I'm going to live my day to the glory of God, and I haven't hardly gotten out the door, and what happened? Why did I just do what I said I wasn't going to do, what I didn't want to do, what I even asked God to help me not to do? Why do I so often fail to do the things I want to do? Okay, God, today I'm going to do this. Today I'm going to witness. Today I'm going to spend time in your word. Today I'm going to memorize scripture. Today I'm going to commit more time to pray. Today I'm going to do this in my relationships with someone else. Today I'm going to make this situation right that I know has not been what it should be with another Christian or maybe somebody outside of the faith. And God, I know what you need to deal with. I, want, I know you want me to deal with this. I'm going to do it today. And you haven't been lying. You haven't been disingenuous with yourself. This is the heart attitude. Yes, this is what I want to do today to the glory of God. But why is it so often that you walk out with that expectation, but it never happens? And you know what Paul is saying in this text? He is saying because this is his experience so often that he laments the fact that he is carnal. He laments the fact that he says, my flesh is sold under sin. I think then Paul is giving some logic here, and he logically reasons why this is true, and he knows it to be true in verses 16 and 7. He says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What's Paul saying here in these verses? Well, one he's saying, if Paul is doing the very things that he does not wish to do, the things which God law ex expressly forbids, he is consenting that the law itself is good. Okay, He's making a mental acknowledgement that I know what I'm supposed to do. It's what I wanted to do. I'm unfortunately not always doing it, but I'm consenting under the law that it is good. And if Paul is so often doing what he would not do, or failing to do what he would do, he then knows it must be the result of something a powerful influence or force in my life. What is that? Well, he describes it here. He says it's sin. It is sin that is dwelling in me. Now, having just said what I did a little while back about the dichotomy of man, I certainly don't want to overreach and go somewhere we shouldn't, but this is where it is helpful, I sense, to understand that the Christian experience is somewhat split in parts, if you will. It's dichotomous. Paul doesn't want to do evil things. And he does want to do right things. This can only be the fact or the result of the fact that he is now a new creature in Christ Jesus. Something has changed, right? He now has righteous desires. Well, where did they come from? Well, it wasn't something that he naturally had. It's something that was granted unto him, given unto him. What is that? It's the very nature of Christ that's been implanted in him. It's the new nature he has received from Christ at the time of his salvation. So there is a part of Paul that truly desires to do right, that wants to glorify God in all things. Can we say it this way in the words of Jesus? One that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. But Paul laments that at the same time, while that is true, he so often does the exact opposite. And he says, as I reason through this and think through this logically, what can be the explanation for this? Paul's statement to the Romans is this, this can only be the case because my flesh remains sold under sin. There's a part of me that is still not yet redeemed. There's a part of me <laughs> that is still very susceptible to sin and its evil desires. So we could say it this way, I think, this morning. Paul, the maturing Christian, laments first that his flesh is sold under sin. He has a second lament here as he goes on and says this. Paul laments, nothing good dwells in my flesh. Nothing good dwells in my flesh. Let's look at verses 18 through 20. 
Paul writes, for I know that in me, and he is good to point out here and, and quick to point out that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So turning his attention now to the flesh specifically, this part of him that's still yet unredeemed, Paul makes an incredible assertion. It really is incredible when you stop and think about it. Sometimes we have to read these verses and give a double take and say, what did you say? Paul says, I know that in me, and he specifies, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Did you get it? Dwelleth no good thing. I think this is a reminder of what Paul had said earlier in this epistle about the total depravity of man. Back in chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, Paul had said this, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of their way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That was the statement the apostle made about all of fallen humanity, both Jews and Gentiles, that there is not one righteous individual upon the face of planet Earth because all of us are the offspring of Adam and we have all been formed in sin. And he said there's not a good thing in us. Now, praise God, because of the power of the gospel, this has changed in the sense that the Christian now has been declared righteous through their faith in Jesus. So God has declared us righteous because he sees us now through the righteousness of Christ. And we also know, and Paul has alluded to this already in this Romans epistle, that the Christian has also been granted Jesus' own righteous nature so that the one who is in Jesus truly does now desire righteous things and truly can glorify God in his life. Romans chapter 5 spoke to that quite a bit and Romans chapter 6. But Paul's teaching here in Romans chapter 7 does remind us that this has not changed anything with respect to the Christian's flesh, the still unredeemed portion of the Christian. And because this is true, Paul's words here today declare that my flesh remains totally depraved here. My flesh, he says, in my flesh there dwells no good thing. Nothing. Nothing. Again, now, as if seeking to answer how Paul knows this to be true, he says at the end of verse 18 into verse 19, he says this. Here's how I know it. For the will is present with me, for how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. No matter how much he desires to do the right thing, Paul is saying here what? His flesh always resists doing it. Have you ever felt it? <laughs> here, Lord, and you just had a wonderful time of communion. Lord, here I am. This is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. This is the way my life, my, my day is going to unfold for your glory today, God. And the moment, sometimes, you don't even get down to the end of the prayer. Sometimes in the midst of the prayer, you're already being opposed. Where does that opposition come from? Well, we know the Bible says one of those opposers is Satan himself. He's certainly there opposing us. We also know that this unsaved world is opposing us. We, we feel that every time, right? You walk out the door and you're lambasted by everything that's anti-God. So this world is opposing us if we're trying to live for God. But you know what Paul reminds us about here? He says there's someone else that's opposing us, probably a greater opposition than anybody else. And you know who's opposing me? Kirk's opposing me. <laughs> My own flesh is opposing me. The Apostle Paul writes here. And no matter how much Paul is personally repulsed by those things which are contrary to God's righteous purposes, he says, you know what? My flesh continually craves them. Why is this true? I think Paul answers in verse 20. Now if I do that, I, that I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. 
Paul says, the reason why I never do the things I should do and the reason why I do things that I am repulsed by doing is because sin dwells in my flesh. It's still there. And I far too often allow it to have its way. So Paul laments that he's sold under sin. Paul secondly laments there's nothing good that dwells in his flesh. Third, Paul's third lament is this, in that I'm going to call it the law of indwelling sin. Let's look at verses 21 through 23. He says, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Paul here proffers what we could call the law of indwelling sin. And in this case, Paul is using the term law here in the sense of speaking of a principle or an undeniable reality. We speak of the law of gravity, right? I mean, throw an object up, it comes to the ground. Why? Because of the law of gravity. He's speaking and using the term law in that sense. A, an undeniable reality, a, a principle that always is true. And Paul's point in saying this would appear to be this. Paul does not want the Romans to be able to hear Paul's testimony concerning his struggles and come away saying, well, Paul, I'm sorry that this is a struggle for you. Paul, I'll even pray for you, but that's not my situation. I don't ever struggle this way. We've alluded, alluded to this before, but there are those that would have us to believe they don't struggle with sin. Have you ever met them? I don't struggle with sin. I'm over that. I'm beyond that. That's not a problem for me. Those who would have us believe, maybe this is the way they frame it, there's a place in your Christian experience that you can arrive at. Or there's a series of steps or activities the Christian can undertake. Or there is a mindset... If you just get it in there and lock it in there as the Christian, you will no longer be tempted by sin. And sin will no longer overcome you in your life. There are those, maybe we could frame it this way, there are those who would say, there are good Christians out there, and good Christians don't struggle with sin. But you know what Paul, and I'm so thankful he wrote this passage. <laughs> You know what Paul informs us is true? He asserts that he has found the reality of the ever presence of evil to be a law, an undeniable reality, a principle of life, if you will. And he says it is an unchanging reality in his life, and he's presenting it in this sense to say it is an unchangeable reality in the lives of every Christian. And how does he know that this is true? How can Paul make such a bold assertion? Well, look at verses 22 and 23. He says, this is how I know it. For I delight in the law of God. Here he's speaking of, again, the law that God gave us, the Mosaic law, after the inward man. But I see another law, again, that principle, if you will, in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. How does Paul know this is true? Because Paul says, my inward man delights in God's law, his moral commandments, but the moment then I attempt to uphold God's law, he says, another law, an unchangeable principle, tries to take over in my body. And this law in my members, he says, goes to war immediately with the law of my mind. And many times, if not most of the time, Paul seems to be lamenting, it brings my members, the very members of my body, into captivity to the law of sin. The way Paul frames this, I would have to believe that he is writing this as no seldomly experienced phenomenon. And he certainly does not seem to be approaching this as that this is just the, the experience of the weak or unexperienced Christian. No, he's saying, this is my experience. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, the mature believer. It is the law, Paul says, of indwelling sin within my members. And then this moves Paul to his fourth and final lament, which is this, the wretchedness of his body of death. 
the wretchedness of his body of death. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. The Scottish pastor and theologian Robert Haldane said this, Men perceive themselves to be sinners in direct proportion as they have previously discovered the holiness of God and His law. Can I read that again? Men perceive themselves to be sinners in direct proportion as they have previously discovered the holiness of God and His law. In essence, is this is what he's saying, I believe. The closer one gets to God the more one understands God's righteous expectations within the law, and the more one becomes aware of his own remaining sinfulness. You know, I think one of the problems we have with this text in Romans chapter 7 is we're saying, wait a minute, whoa, wait, put the brakes on! (laughs) If a very apostle of Jesus Christ has not gotten victory over anything in his life, then what good is this salvation anyway? Well, I don't know that that's what Paul is implying here, although I do think there can be certain areas of of struggle of sin that we can struggle our entire lives with. But I think perhaps what Paul is implying here by this statement is this, you know what, the more I grow in Christ, the more I mature, the closer I get to God, the more I understand His expectations, the more I desire those things, the more I become aware of what remains in me that is still not pleasing to Him. In other words, the we, can we say it this way, if we want to use these terms, the better Christian I become, the more aware of sin I am in my life. That's not contradictory, that's complementary. <laughs> I'm getting closer to God. The light is shining brighter. The brighter the light shines, the more it exposes. Paul laments the wretchedness of his body of death. And he wonders out loud, and I think he does this on purpose, both for his own sake and the Roman Christian's benefit. Who, he asks, or what will ever be able to deliver me? His answer is verse 25, right? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. By making this statement, Paul is acknowledging there is nothing he is going to be able to do. Nothing Paul can do to overcome this body of sin. And by making this statement, Paul is acknowledging that there is nothing that even God's holy, just, and good law is going to be able to do to help him overcome this body of sin. We've already talked about that earlier in Romans chapter 7. Could we maybe say it this way? Please listen carefully and let me explain before you accuse me of heresy. By making this statement, Paul is even, I believe, acknowledging that there is nothing his new nature in Jesus is going to be able to do to overcome this body of sin. Let me say it this way. Even though he now possesses Jesus' own righteous nature, he will continually struggle with the wretchedness of his body of sin. In other words, even though I am truly converted and the nature of Christ resides within me, His very Holy Spirit lives within my body, the Bible teaches, that in no way changes the reality of my flesh. It is what it has always been. An instrument that never does anything good. Ever. Therefore, as Paul cries out for an answer, then what is the hope? I mean, good grief, if he doesn't have an answer here, then let's all shut our books and go home, right? What are we doing here? That's kind of foolish. So he cries out, what is the answer? And his answer is what? I thank God. Oh, wait a minute, he has hope? Yes, I have hope. I thank God, he says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, well, that makes sense. That sounds like something really orthodox and Christian to say. Praise Jesus. Well, what does he mean, though? What is he praising God for with relation to Jesus? And Paul may have had a whole thing, slew of things in his mind. I'm sure he did. <laughs> All kinds of things that he was thinking about. Since he doesn't tell us, I can't know for sure. But as I think of things he might be thanking God for in Jesus with relation to what he's talking about, I would just want to bring out three real quickly as we close our message this morning, things that bring me comfort and encouragement. Maybe they will as you. Maybe Paul is thanking God through Jesus Christ our Lord that this, that even given this reality, the reality of the Christian's continuing struggle with indwelling sin within his flesh, if we are truly in Christ, we are under no condemnation. 
Isn't that what he just is going to go on to say in chapter 8, verse 1? After all of this, he says what? Therefore, <laughs> there is now no condemnation than what you're in Christ Jesus. So maybe one of the things, as he's even preparing himself for what's to come, and as he's thinking in his own mind ahead, he's saying, I lament this wretched body of sin. <laughs> it exasperates me. What is the answer for this? You know, you know what the answer is? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Why, Paul, do you thank God? Because you know what Paul says, even though my day is an incessant struggle against the desires, the evil desires of my flesh, I know this. Never once has my acceptability to God the Father been questioned by Him. How does Paul know that? Because there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Suck on that one for a while. In light of what Paul has just said, You mean my 24-hour day experience could be none other than an incessant struggle with these evil desires? You mean that's what could consume me throughout my entire day? And at the end of that day, God the Father doesn't look on me any differently at the end of my day than He did at the beginning? That's exactly what Paul is saying, and it's what I'm saying too. And you know why that's true? Because there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Praise God, when he looks at me, he doesn't see me, he sees Jesus. I never have been accepted in God's sight because of anything I do, and I never will be. I'm only accepted in his sight because of what Jesus did. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I think that's one of the things Paul is thanking God for. Are there others? I think perhaps there is. Maybe Paul is thinking ahead, and maybe he's also saying this. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord because you know what? A day is coming when even this wretched body of sin is going to be transformed. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Familiar passage, but let's read it for our own pleasure this morning in light of what we've been talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's pick up in verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, we know that speaking of Christ, was made a quickening spirit, one who can make dead things alive. Howbeit that which was that which was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are also they that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither the corruption inherit corruption. What's he saying there in verse 15? He says, this old body I'm battling with right now, it ain't ever going to heaven. Because if it went to heaven, it wouldn't be heaven anymore, right? Heaven's a good place. It's a righteous place. People there kind of please glorify God. This old flesh is never pleased and glorify God, Paul is asserting. Therefore, it's not going there. This corruption cannot inherit incorruption. But I'm glad he doesn't end there. Verse 51, he goes on and says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we won't all die, but we will all be changed, and that's a necessity. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what my glorified body is going to look like one day. I don't know if I'm going to have a receding hairline or a pot belly like I do today, but I know this one thing. I am never going to be struggling with sin in my new body. Because my body is going to be a perfect body, just like God intended it to be from the beginning. 
And as Paul is lamenting the wretchedness of his current flesh, perhaps he's thinking on, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Because there's coming a day. Not only am I not condemned for the struggles I've had in this earthly body, but I am also going to get a brand new body to complement the new nature that I am in Christ. And I'm going to be able to live in His presence forever and serve Him in this new body that He's given me. Praise God! Right? I mean, I get tired of what I can't do physically anymore just because I'm an old man and wore out and don't exercise. I lament that. But more than that, as a Christian, I lament my utter failure to glorify God. And the times that this old flesh just wants to do everything to dishonor God. I'm sick of it. I'm ready to be done with it. Praise God, one day I will be. I think Paul perhaps had maybe one other thought in mind. I don't know. One of the reasons why he could thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and perhaps that is this, that through the power of Jesus' indwelling Holy Spirit, it is possible for the Christian to even actually fulfill some of the righteous expectations of God even in this present body. Look what he says. If you're back in Romans chapter 8 or 7, look what he says later on in chapter 8 that we'll look at in just a few weeks, Lord willing. In verses three and, or 2 through 4, he writes this, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. And then he makes this interesting statement, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, in Him, in Paul, in the Roman Christians, in who they are right now, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We'll spend more time developing that when we get into Romans chapter 8, but it would appear to me that Paul is actually saying this. You know what? That even though it's going to be a struggle, there is the possibility because of the grace of God and the power of Christ that I can actually even take these members that are not yet redeemed and I can use them to do things that truly glorify God the Father. When it's the power of God living through this body, doing it. He kind of hinted at that in chapter 6 when we were studying that a while back. He's going to develop it more fully in chapter 8. And it's maybe one of the things that Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I lament this wretched body and all of its struggles. But you know what? Even given that to the power of God's Spirit, I can do things that glorify Him in this very body. That's encouraging. And that really is the, much of the teaching of Romans chapter 8. That's why it's so glorious. That's why everybody wants to run there. I don't blame you. I want to go there too. But I do think there's a problem. I don't think we're really ready to receive the glorious teaching of chapter 8 or to properly walk in it if we are not willing to first acknowledge the reality of Romans chapter 7. And you know why? At least I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you from personal experience the reason why is because I don't really walk in the Spirit of Christ. I actually attempt to do these spiritual things in my own strength. And you know what? That's impossible. That's impossible. So the reality of Romans 7 is critical if we're going to be prepared for the teaching of Romans 8. And what is it? Paul's laments. I lament that my flesh is sold under sin. I lament that nothing good dwells in my flesh. I lament that there's a law of indwelling sin in me. And I lament the wretchedness of this body of death. I was talking to somebody else this past week, a pastor friend of mine on the phone just yesterday, two days ago. And we were talking about things, and I said, he said, what are you doing? What are you preaching? And I said, Romans chapter 7. I said, you want to send me a good message? Because... I'm not so sure about this one. We were talking through some of these concepts on the phone. And he was saying, you know, I think a lot of times people don't like Romans chapter 7 because, at least pastors don't, because they fear that their people, upon hearing this, will use Paul's teaching here in Romans chapter 7 as justification for condoning the sin that goes on in their lives. And I'm sure that's probably true. Probably could be. That's probably another sign of the wretchedness of our flesh, that we would try to turn this to our advantage. But I think that's why I appreciated MacArthur's approach to this text. And he said, these are Paul's laments. And if he's, if he's right there, and I think he definitely is, then they are laments because 
These are things that Paul battles with every day. Realities that he wishes would just go away. But they haven't. Therefore, he laments them. He hates them. He fights against them. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in Romans in 1 Corinthians chapter 9? He said this, Know ye not that they which run a race, he's obviously talking about the race of life, run all, but only one kind of runner receives the prize. So run, he says, that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I, Paul speaking of himself, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Our King James English doesn't maybe necessarily bring out that sense so much, but that phrase, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, it seems to carry the idea that Paul pummels his flesh daily. He battles with his flesh daily to keep it in subjection. Lest, he says, when I preach to others, obviously the gospel, how to be delivered, he himself would be seen to be a castaway. In this very Roman epistle in chapter 13, he says this in verses 11 through 14, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. Certainly, by these other statements from Paul, he makes so many other in the New Testament Scriptures, we know there is no way that Paul is using the realities that he's teaching are true concerning him in Romans chapter 7 as an excuse for a failure to fight against sin every day. Paul daily seeks to mortify the lusts of his flesh every moment of every day. We dare not go away from this message saying, oh, Pastor Mellon is excusing sinning and saying it's inevitable. Since it's inevitable, I shouldn't worry about it. That's not what Paul is saying, and that's not what I'm saying in this message this morning either. But I do want us to be honest, and I'm thankful that Paul was honest to know what we are up against. And I do want us to understand that the presence of sinful temptation is not the sign that we are a bad Christian or a second-class Christian. I've seen many Christians, I've set them in my office and counseled with them, I've seen so many Christians who live in despondency and despair because they cannot understand why they are still tempted with sin. You're still tempted with sin because your flesh is wicked. That's why. It's the reality of a part of you that God is not yet in His grace fully redeemed. Do you remember what Paul said? There is nothing good in us. The only good that we possess right now is the good that God has made of us through Christ. Any part that He has chosen not yet to touch still remains with no vestige of goodness in it. So when we go through our day and we find this continual struggle with the temptation to sin, that is not a sign that you are a bad Christian. Can I dare say this? It may be a sign that you are a definitely maturing Christian. Because maybe the more you're pursuing Christ, the more hostility arises from within that says, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to do those things. I don't want to glorify God. It's the reality of the battle we're up against. Paul's point and my point is to remind us that we will be in this struggle against sin the entirety of our Christian experience until Jesus returns or He calls us home. The pastor why did you have to say that? You mean there's no discharge from this army? No, there's not. The moment you said, I receive Christ, you signed up. And the battle was on. And you'll face this battle till you either give up the ghost <laughs> or the eastern sky splits and Jesus comes and receives us into His presence. Until then, buckle up and wage war, because that's what you're up against. 
If Paul had to wage this war, certainly you and I will have to wage it. Father, this morning, I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. I know it can be discouraging, Lord. I pray that somehow we can step behind the veil and see the encouragement of it. The reality that there is a transformational process going on. That we do now have new desires given unto us by you. That we do now have righteous expectations and righteous desires and a hope to glorify God. Those are all testimonies to the fact that we are Christian. That we receive Christ. That we have His new nature. So Lord, may we be encouraged in that reality. But Father, may we also be reminded through this clear and transparent teaching of Paul, using himself as an example of his teaching, that even though that reality of the gospel is so adamantly true in our lives, there remains the parts of us who have not yet been impacted by that gospel that are going to fight us every step of the way. Knowing this up front better prepares us to both understand, appreciate, undertake this walk of faith, and look for hope, which Paul is going to give us in the next chapter. Father, I don't know how you want to use this in our lives today individually, but my prayer is that you would encourage those that need to be encouraged, convict perhaps those that need to be convicted, strengthen all of us, we pray, and unsaved, I pray you would draw to Christ. We thank you for what you are doing and what you will do. We ask it all in Jesus' name.